seems like we're all here. Um, is Estuardo here? Oh, sorry, no, no, I don't, I don't see him. <clears throat> uh, Paula, can you please send Estuardo a, a message? Absolutely, Commissioner. I think that Luciana is here too. Yeah. Oh, Luciana. Yeah, absolutely. Yo estoy en contacto con el comisionado. Sí, sí. Dile que le estamos esperando y que ya con él empezamos en las en punto. Muy bueno. El estado ya está. Buenos días, Estuardo. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Qué tal, Carlos? Gusto saludarte. Buen día a todas las personas. ¿Qué tal, Larry? Buen día. Hola, Estuardo. El Estado ya está conectado, pero tenemos que empezar el webinar para poder ponerlos como panelistas. Así que cuando quieran, comenzamos. Pues em empecemos, empecemos. Me, me da luz verde para empezar, eh, Lu Luciana. Sí, listo. Ok, good morning to everyone. And I would like to welcome the civil society organizations and also the representative of the state of Canada uh, to this hearing, the number eight in this 190 period of sessions, uh, which is about the right to health and companies in Canada. My name is Carlos Bernal, and I, I am the first vice, pres vice president of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, and I will chair in this session. I have the pleasure to introduce two of my fellow commissioners today, um, Commissioner Estuardo Rolón and also Commissioner Arif Vulcan. And both of them uh, will, will be with me in this hearing and we will uh, lead the deliberation or the dialogue between the civil society organizations and the state. I would like first to thank um, the civil society organizations for requesting this very interesting hearing and also acknowledge the responsiveness and the presence of the state and the, the willingness to engage in this uh, very interesting dialogue. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to recall that the Inter-American Human Rights Commission is celebrating the, uh, 65 years of war committed to the defense and promotion of human rights, thanks to the common interests and pacts of the states and societies to give life to the American Convention and the Democratic Charter. Since 1959, hundreds of professionals have passed through the institutions and thousands of individuals, groups and people have turned to the commission seeking protection, justice, and reparation. We celebrate 65 years of history, with more than 100 on-site visits with their uh, corresponding reports, more than 1,000 precautionary measures granted, more than 750 reports on the merits, uh, 220 friendly settlements, and 377 cases sent to the court. All of these with the victims as the central focus of our work and our priority. As a rapporteur um, for the rights of the people with disabilities, I would like to ensure that this hearing is inclusive and for the reason we, I would like to ask all participants to begin their presentations by stating their name, position, and organization or institutions they represent. Subsequently, each time they take the floor, we ask that they repeat their name at the beginning so that the visually impaired can identify who is speaking. Likewise, we remind, you, we remind you that these activities have some subtitles available. Each person can activate them directly from their computers and choose to the display size. They are also available to follow, for those to follow us through the commission's challenge. So before I give the floor to the civil society organizations, uh, I would like to um, state the order of participation in these hearings. First, the civil society will have 20 minutes to make uh, their introductory remarks. Then the state will have 
uh, 20 minutes to respond. Then we as a commission, we will have uh, again 20 minutes to make comments and questions. After that, the civil society will have 12 minutes uh, for a uh, concluding remarks, uh, plus 12 minutes of the state for a uh, concluding remarks. And then uh, we, the commissioners, we will uh, close uh, the hearing. So uh, this is my introduction. And uh, with this said, I would like to give the floor to the organizations of the civil society. Thank you so much. So who will be the first to speak from the civil society organization? It will be me, David Mazzini from Amnesty International. Please, thank you so much. You, you guys can have the floor and then you can share the word according to your order. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much. I am not able to hear you. I wonder if my colleagues can hear you. Um, I am um, wondering the same thing myself. Can you hear me now? Right now, yes. No. 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 We cannot hear you regret, regrettably. I wonder if another person from the civil society can take the floor. But it appears his mic is muted. Yes, I think his mic, your mic is muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, if it cuts me again, I'll ask Erin to take over. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, David. Please go ahead. No, as soon as you begin speaking, uh, then the sound cuts. Uh, I'll, I'll present from here. Uh, Please, Erin. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, commissioners, uh, state representatives, and everyone watching this hearing. Uh, speaking previously was David Matsinhe, and speaking now, my name is Erin Riley Odell. Uh, we are both from Amnesty International Canada English Speaking Section. With us today is Belissa Guerrero Rivas from Amnesty International, and representatives from Grassy Narrows, Chief Turtle, and Judy De Silva. We thank the commissioners for this hearing. We are present in this hearing to explain the urgent crisis in the er Grassy Narrows First Nation and demand that Canada respond to their human rights obligations. The Grassy Narrows First Nation was a self-sustaining Anishinaabe Indigenous community on the English and Wabagoon rivers in the province of Ontario until a pulp and paper mill in nearby Dryden had a terrible impact on them. The mill used a chloralkali process which produced mercury as a waste product. Between 1962 and 1970, the mill discharged approximately 20,000 pounds of mercury into the Wabagoon River. The impacts were officially recognized in 1970 when the river's fish were found to contain exorbitantly high concentrations of mercury. The community consuming the fish had been poisoned for a decade. While the government of Canada has engaged in some actions, it is dismal. Over 40, 50 years later, the fish consumption advisories remain in place and Grassy Narrows fish are among the most contaminated in Canada. I'll detail core breaches of Canada's human rights obligations to the Grassy Narrows First Nation with relevant articles of the American Declaration. First, the desecration of the rivers, the failure to remediate them, and the ongoing discharge of contaminants into the river severely impedes the Anishinaabe from practicing their cultural way of life in breach of Article 13, as clean rivers are essential to this practice. Second, the life, liberty, and security of the Grassy Narrows community members continues to be at significant risk. By 2016, 90% of Grassy Narrows adults were exposed to mercury, including in utero, resulting in significant physical and cognitive health issues. Intergenerational poisoning resulted in youth today having a drastically high suicide rate. The Canadian government has not provided sufficient health care to treat the ongoing state of mercury poisoning, breaching Articles 11, 6, and 7. Third, the poisoning of the waters resulted in a ban on commercial fishing, 
the main economy of the community. Grassy Narrows went from self-sustaining to over 80% unemployment overnight. Canada has not sufficiently addressed its, its employment and social security obligations under Articles 14 and 16. Fourth, the community issued a land declaration on their traditional territory in 2018 to stop industrial activities that could worsen the mercury contamination. Canada has still not recognized the declaration, and since then, approximately 5,000 mining claims have been granted in the area, violating the right to self-determination. Canada has also allowed the mill in Dryden to continue to discharge chemicals, which prolong and exacerbate the mercury problem by stimulating the conversion of mercury into its most toxic form in the river. I will now hand it over to Chief Turtle. Thank you. Morning, I'm Chief Rudy Turtle, Brasino First Nation. Just want to say that uh, we have been living under difficult circumstances. As you have heard, that our economy was destroyed back in the late 60s and early 70s. There was a time when we were self sufficient. There was a time when people went fishing and lived, lived off the river, our river system. Our river system is uh, quite long. It stretches um, all the way from uh, past Dryden, Ontario, and all the way down to really goes to Manitoba. <clears throat> but uh, mercury has been uh, deposited in, in Dryden, Dryden, Ontario. And has messed up our river, has uh, poisoned our river, which has uh, resulted in making uh, our lives very difficult. Our people, um, health has been compromised. Many of our people are very sick. They uh, have problems with their uh, nervous system. Some people can't, uh, hold objects properly because they shake, too much shaking. And also some people can't really walk properly. And so, you know, our children are affected, our women, our adults, the whole community. And uh, many have lost hope to the point that they don't even uh, try to live a normal life as we know it, such as going to work or going to school, having the routine of being able to get up in the morning and go about your activity. Uh, many have chosen just to stay home and, and um, not do very much because they've lost the motivation to uh, continue with their activities. However, as a community, we have tried that we continue to, as a leadership, we continue to have programs to support our people. We do the best we can with uh, recreation and social activities. And also we have more programs in terms of our education system. We uh, are training our people to become um, PSWs and nurses and other types of health professionals, even uh, going into training our people to be health counselors and so forth. So despite the difficult circumstances we live in, we are, you know, doing the best we can to get our community moving. And it is moving, like we do have activities Every day, there's uh, activities for our children. As a matter of fact, this week we are, we have uh, people visiting from uh, from down south. Um, we have a professional hockey player coming to our community to speak to our children. And there's a sports camp going on this week. And there's other uh, uh, summer camps going on as well. So we're doing the best we can to... Uh, continue to live a normal life despite uh, 
what we are facing immediately with the mercury poisoning. It is very sad. It is very uh, alarming, especially what bothers me the most is the fact that the Canadian government knows what's going on. The provincial government knows what's going on. They have continually assured us that they're no longer uh, dumping poison in our, in, our, in our river system, but apparently that's not true because uh, a few weeks, uh, about a month ago, a scientist uh, gave his report. Uh, in his report, he speaks of affluence uh, being dumped into the river and making the mercury more toxic, uh, much stronger. So the safety practices of the paper mill hasn't changed despite their word that, you know, that they are, they have better practices, but it, right now we know that their practices aren't any better than it was back in the 70s. It seems to me they have no regard for human life that's downriver. They don't really care about our people and grassy arrows. They just think about uh, the almighty dollar and uh, so that's the situation. Um, it seems like the indigenous lives don't really matter when it comes to uh, money, when it comes to uh, big corporations uh, securing financial uh, security for their own benefit. It seems like we'll do whatever we can no matter who's affected. It's just for their own profit and, and security. And they don't think about others such as us. And uh, it's uh, very sad. Really, it's very sad. It's continuing in 2024. You would think that by this time, things would have changed. You would think that by this time, especially it's after 50 years, that that people's mindset would change and that we would start thinking about their environment, the long-term destruction that these practices are causing, and uh, that we would can that we would start thinking about our future generation. It's not just indigenous peoples it's really it's the world it's 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 canada it's it's our country and it's our forests and rivers that are being affected and and somehow this needs to stop and canada needs to be needs to change and the province of ontario needs to change as well and right now mining is a big thing there's a lithium mines that are Opposed lithium mines that are in up north and near Deer Lake, Ontario, and there's a mine in Red Lake, Ontario. Uh, it seems like it's just uh, we're being bom being bombarded by mining activities. It's 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 just uh, unbelievable, and it's destroying our communities, and uh, other communities are rising up and doing the best they can to fight as well, such as. Uh, K.I. Kachinamekasip and, and uh, Niskandaga First Nation. And, and together with these First Nations, we've, you know, formed an alliance and, and doing the best we can to stop uh, all these mining activities and, and to speak out against them. And also with the, there's a nuclear mine that's being proposed in Ignis, Ontario. So you can clearly see what's happening. And we're just being, like I said, we're just being bombarded we're just being surrounded by uh, all these activities that compromise the environment and uh, it's uh, quite a scary thing it's uh, I don't know like it just uh, doesn't look too uh, doesn't look too good in terms of uh, the environment and, and the people that uh, live you know we are trying to do the best we can to continue to practice our 
indigenous lifestyle of living off the land and and being able to harvest uh, uh, plants and animals and 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 living a natural diet, but it's becoming much much more difficult in this present day and age. So now you know that's all that I have to say. And I would like uh, Jody to Silva to say a few words. Thank you. Hello, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we, we hear, hear you. you. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, thank you for allowing us to to speak here today in this, this hearing. Uh, I'm Judy De Silva. I'm from Grassy Narrows. I'm the environmental health coordinator, and I'm poisoned by mercury. I'm a mercury sufferer, and I'm I'm talking to you today as a mercury sufferer to understand our our daily struggles. I I live right in the community of Grassy Narrows. Um, so in the community, there's like about maybe 200 houses. A lot of them are multi-family homes. Um, they, like in, in my house, there's five of us in the two bedroom house. And um, so like that, that's how families live. They, they're like, they um, don't get their, not, a lot of them don't get their own space, like their own, for their own family, they, they share homes. So and it's it's um not for lack of trying like um chief rudy turtle and the community been working hard to like address the issues on the ground in the community and w one of the reasons why i'm saying this is for people to visualize grassy narrows and us as a community and how we live daily each day we're semi-remote we live like an hour and a half from the nearest town, nearest hospital. We do have a clinic, but it's not always manned by by nurses. Um, they're here from Monday to Friday. And so sometimes we have, with a population of 800 people that live in the community, we have like emergency situations and um, some of them are life, um, life or death situations. And so when, when this happens, we're kind of at the mercy of the, the air ambulance, which could take 10 minutes to get to Grassy. So being Mercury suffers in Grassy, there's a lot of health issues. Um, I've seen, you know, just me going to Kenora, I've met two ambulances or like at least like I hear an ambulance once a week. Today, uh, Tomorrow we lay one of our relatives to rest. And previous to that was like three people that passed away. So like just trying to let you know, like Rudy, Chief Rudy Turtle met, told you about the community and what we face as a community, all the industrial activity that we face as a small community and how we as like a little tiny village, you know, we we try and fight this thing, but like he like he said, you know, the the people's hearts are on the ground and we do our best to to fight this big monster that's poisoning us. And we can, you know, like you'll see online all the reports of the mercury poisoning, you know, just go on the internet and go to Grassy Narrows mercury poisoning. And you'll also find many, many videos. The one that touches me the most is called Home to Me. 
and it was made by the young people in Grassy Narrows, and and um, every time I listen to the the Home to Me song on YouTube, it just makes me cry because the words these kids say in the in the video is like really plain and simple, and to them, Grassy Narrows is home to me. And that's same with us, like with with um, people my age. I was born nineteen sixty two. When they say that the mercury started being dumped, and I don't want to excuse the company there. They say that um, a spill or the biggest disaster. It wasn't a disa disaster. It wasn't a spill. It was premeditated thought to put put this stuff into our our water. They they knew they're doing that. They knew we're downstream. And still to this day they do that. So I wanted to give you that perspective as a as a mother, a grandmother of of what we're up against. Thank you for listening. Miigwech. Thank you so much to the persons uh, that spoke uh, on behalf of the civil society. Uh, I think right now is the time for the state to respond. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Please. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, chief and members of the Grassy Narrows First Nation, members of the Secretariat, members of civil society organizations, and observers. My name is Konstantin Tikhanov. Over the last 20 years, I work as a manager with the Environmental Public Health Division of the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch, now Department of Indigenous Services Canada. I'm honored to represent Canada at today's hearing. As always, we welcome the opportunity to engage with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Thank you as well for the opportunity to discuss the important issue being examined during today's hearing and to present Canada's testimony on this matter. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Ottawa, Ontario, the land from which I am joining you today, is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. First, it is important to understand access to health care in Canada. Canada's healthcare system is publicly funded through the Government of Canada and administered across 13 provincial and territorial healthcare insurance plans. Under this system, people living in Canada, including Indigenous peoples, have reasonable access to medically necessary healthcare services insured by the province or territory where they reside and falling under the Federal Canada Health Act, ensuring principles of public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, portability, and accessibility. Within this system, outside of British Columbia, the federal government also provides registered First Nations with a broad range of services where coverage is not available through private or provincial health insurance. For example, the non-insured health benefits program provides vision and dental care, prescription drugs, and medical transportation. For First Nations residing in reserve communities, additional services may also be available, such as nursing and mental health services. As the government of Canada, we recognize that improvement in First Nations overall health outcomes requires the federal role in health services to move from one of service provider and towards the one of funding and governance partner that supports First Nations in designing and delivering health programs and services that are aligned with their own priorities, circumstances, and ways of knowing and doing. For example, I referenced British Columbia earlier. In 2013, the Government of Canada transferred funding and responsibility for design, delivery, and management of First Nations health programs and services in that province um, to the First Nations Health Authority, which works closely with the provincial health system to better coordinate health services. This approach has been held up as the model for future health transformation in Canada. Now I would like to speak to you about evolving science in relation to past high level of mercury exposure in grassy narrows and white dog. 
Grassineros and White Dog are English language names applied to these First Nations communities. Recognizing and respecting the language and traditions of these Ojibwe nations, I will refer to them as ANA, which is an abbreviation of the name of the community in the Ojibwe lang language, which I don't speak and I don't want to offend anyone by mispronouncing the full name, and Wabasimung for the remainder of my remarks. In 1960 and the 1970s, when mercury contamination of the English Wabigun River system and human exposure among residents of ANA and Wabasimung were identified, the science of mercury and its impacts on wildlife and humans was quickly evolving. Little was known or understood at the time about toxic forms of organic mercury, and in Canada there was no mercury guideline for safe human consumption. Methyl mercury came to global attention in the late 1950s and early 1960s, following major epidemics of poisoning in Minamata Bay, Japan, and other locations around the world. Methyl mercury thereafter was understood to be a significant environmental contaminant that poses major health risks. With increasing scientific understanding of mercury forms and cycling in the environment, a greater concern for the health effects of environmental mercury has emerged. In the late 1960s, work of scholars had demonstrated that mercury in fish was almost entirely in the form of methyl mercury, regardless of the form of mercury contaminating the surrounding waters, and that inorganic mercury is methylated by microorganisms in rivers and lake sediments. The methyl mercury produced in this manner then bioaccumulates up the food chain to eventually reach significant levels, particularly in predatory fish and sea mammals. In Canada, this new science brought to light a potential risk for First Nations and the Inuit who frequently consume fish as a core part of their traditional diet. In the 1970s, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources sampled 19 species of fish from 47 lakes in northwestern Ontario. Results showed very high levels of mercury that, according even to the limited knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge at the time, were sufficient to cause mercury poisoning among highly exposed people. The highest recorded levels from this Ontario study were from the fish in the English Wabigoon River system. Around the same time, Ontario also conducted human biomonitoring for mercury among a small sample of ANA residents to directly assess their level of mercury exposure. As more information was learned, the government of Canada took measures to help protect and support the communities. Canada banned consumption of fish from these rivers with the government of Ontario introducing a program to supply ANA with fish from uncontaminated waters. In 1971, National Health and Welfare, now Health Canada, issued a nationwide guideline forbidding the distribution, sale or consumption of freshwater fish with more than 0.5 microgram per kilogram or parts per million of mercury. To respond to the problem of high and unusual mercury levels in relation to the health and well-being of ANA and Wabasimung residents, in 1973, the Minister of National Health and Welfare established the Task Force on Organic Mercury in the Environment. At the recommendation of the task force and to better understand the impacts of mercury contamination on the health and well-being of communities living along the English Wabigoon River system, National Health and Welfare implemented a national mercury biomonitoring program for First Nations and Inuit in the early 1970s. The program was run out of the Medical Services Branch, now known as the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of the Indigenous Services Canada, and I'll refer hereafter to this as FINIB. To identify at-risk individuals and provide appropriate preventive action, FINIB established a set of biomonitoring guidance values that took into account evidence of possible clinical effects at blood levels established in reports by the World Health Organization and applied safety factor that was considered uh, at the time. Uh, at uh, all residents of ANA whose mercury blood levels were found to exceed the at-risk level of mercury exposure were invited to undergo clinical examination. In this specific instance that was reported in the peer-reviewed literature, none of the very small sample of residents that participated were found to have acute or chronic clinical effects of methyl mercury poisoning. Our collective understanding of the impacts of mercury exposure has continued to evolve. Updated health risk assessment and consumption advice for Canadians around mercury and fish was published in 2007. And since then, new health effects data have been published. Health Canada has made progress in recent years to increase understanding of the biological process underlying mercury toxicity, 
and mercury uh, cycling, mer and uh, some research has been published on possible therapies that could potentially reverse or diminish these toxic effects. New research also suggests that nutrition may play an important uh, role in reducing the toxic effects of mercury. I would like to speak now about the evolution of biomonitoring studies. Between 1971 and 96, FINIBA undertook extensive biomonitoring of First Nations and Inuit across Canada, including ANA and Wabasimung residents. Monitoring consisted of blood and hair sampling uh, and analysis in the Mercury Reference Laboratory that was established at FINIB. Results were provided to participants, or in the case of children and infants, their parents, and then published in the aggregate level in the uh, three volumes of Methyl Mercury in Canada publication in 79, 1984, and 1999. Sampled leveled, levels were measured against guidelines established by FINIB, and in 1974, following recommendations of the task force, these guidelines were adopted by Health Canada as national guidelines. Where results were found to be within the at-risk range for mercury in hair or blood, neurological exams were offered. Surveillance results showed that between 1971 and 1996, there was a very significant decline in the number of at-risk results, including in ANA. The maximum level of mercury detected in any individual during this period also continued to decline. Follow-up testing showed a general downward trend from 1974 to 1996. With parental consent, cord blood studies were also undertaken between 1970 and 1992. While records and advice were provided to participants at the time of these studies, study participants can still receive copies of their re records upon request and consent with scientific translation and mental health supports provided as uh, necessary. It is important to note that Health Canada's Mercury Guideline was updated in 2010 to align with existing Canadian exposure guideline for women of childbearing age and children. Furthermore, we have updated fish consumption advice as our understanding of exposure to mercury in fish has evolved. When elevated mercury levels are found, people are advised to consume fish species that are not predatory and lower in the food chain, and to avoid predatory species such as pike and walleye that are higher on the food chain and as such tend to have higher mercury levels. In predatory species, uh, if predatory species are to be consumed, advice is given to choose smaller fish uh, as they contain less mercury. Today, this advice has also been translated into Ojibwe language. The overall decline in mercury rates over time suggests that this advice is prudent. Between 2015 and 2018, at the request and direction of the ANA chief, federal resources were dedicated to perform an archival review of the hard copy reports contained in more than 85 archival boxes and to compile and collate mercury testing results from the earlier biomonitoring program. In keeping with the Canada's Privacy Act, permission was sought and obtained by the ANA chief to release this data to a leading mercury research scientist who wanted the data to inform their research. During that time, FINIP communicated regularly with the community leaders to provide updates on the status of the work. These data continue to be used by the research scientists to undertake additional research on the associated direct and indirect impacts of historical mercury exposure on community residents. This research was partly funded by FINIP and is informing current federally funded interventions. We also continue to offer sampling and testing of hair to the residents of ANA and Wabasimo. I would like to speak now about the settlement agreement with the communities. In 1986, the governments of Canada and Ontario passed legislation that formalized the settlement agreement reached by all parties in 1985, including both federal and provincial jurisdictions, ANA and Wabasimung and commercial actors. Included in the settlement agreement and formalized through federal and provincial legislation was the creation of the Mercury Disability Board and Associated Mercury Disability Fund. In 2021, a review panel completed their reports on Mercury Disability Board reforms related to culturally sensitive, um, uh, in, in, to cultural sensitivity and advances in knowledge of the health effects of mercury. Indigenous Services Canada supports all the panel recommendations and worked with the province, ANA, and Wabasimung to review and consider any resulting actions and reforms. With regard to the remediation efforts underway, uh, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks has been leading um, the, the work to clean up the river system. 
In 2017, Ontario passed the English and Wabigoon Rivers Remediation Funding Act to formalize funding for mercury remediation. As stated publicly on their website, the government of Ontario has been working with ANA and Wabasimung to gather information about current contamination levels in sediments and fish in the river system and exploring management options for the remediation of these contaminants. The province of Ontario is best positioned, of course, to speak to their activities. Now on to more recent developments concerning the Mercury Care Home, Health Centre and the Water Treatment Plant. In April 2020, the Government of Canada and ANA signed the Mercury Care Home Framework Agreement that committed Canada to providing $19.5 million for the detailed design and construction of a Mercury Care Home. In July 2021, the framework agreement was amended to include a commitment of $68.9 million to fund the care home's operations, maintenance, and specialized service delivery. Most recently, the federal budget 2024 committed an additional $57.5 million towards construction of the ANA Mercury Care Home. Construction is anticipated to start this year and is estimated to last approximately two years. Indigenous Services Canada continues to work with community leadership as they take steps toward realizing their vision. The NA Mercury Care Home will offer specialized care for residents to address their unique health care needs while staying closer to home, community, and family. Between 2015 and 2018, Canada and Ontario provided funding for NA to complete a community health assessment, which included a focus on mercury. Following the community's completion of the assessment and identification of unique short and long-term health, need, health needs, Indigenous Services Canada actively engaged with ANA leadership to advance a new community health facility. The community broke ground for this project in June 2023 and construction has continued to advance. The new health facility will complement the Mercury Care Home by increasing and improving access to broad range of culturally appropriate health services as outlined in the community health assessment. To meet the safe drinking water needs of the community and water distribution requirements related to the two new facilities, the Government of Canada has committed also to support the construction of a new water treatment plant. It is important to know that drinking water in ANA is monitored in accordance with the guidelines for Canadian drinking water quality and the issues of mercury exposure are not associated with drinking water. In September 2020, Indigenous Services Canada also provided Wabasimung with close to $20 million to support the design and construction of its own Mercury Wellness Centre. In closing, Indigenous Services Canada takes very seriously the issue of residual contamination of surface water sources and its impacts on Indigenous communities. Canada will continue to work with ANA and Wabasimung to understand and address mercury contamination and the longer-term impacts of exposure, including working with the province of Ontario at the direction of the community to meet their health services and treatment goals in order to protect the health and safety of the Indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wonder if there is any other person from the state that would like to have the, the word. Okay, if this is not the case, then I would like to give the floor uh, to my fellow commissioners. I will begin with my fellow commissioner, Estuardo Rolon, and then with uh, Commissioner uh, Ari Fulkan. Please, uh, Commissioner Rolon, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, presidente. Muy buen día a representantes del Estado, sociedad civil. Eh, en esta audiencia se han comentado pues aspectos muy relevantes que tienen que ver con la calidad del agua, con el medio ambiente sano, con, con la salud. Sin embargo, yo tenía una pregunta un poco más relacionada a... Tengo entendido que hubo una declaración de la tierra en el año 2018, donde la comunidad, eh, digamos, a manera de resguardar sus derechos y no seguir sufriendo eh, afectaciones al medio ambiente en sus territorios, eh, hizo una declaración sobre sus derechos a, a la tierra. Y esta declaración del 2018 entiendo que que ni Canadá ni Ontario han, la han reconocido como tal y que se han seguido otorgando concesiones mineras. 
eh, quería en su momento tanto a los representantes de la comunidad como al Estado si pudieran abordar este punto eh, respecto al derecho de propiedad o la declaración de la tierra y el, si está reconocida o no está reconocida o si el Estado ha ignorado esta declaración y ha continuado otorgando concesiones mineras que a su vez pues eh, entran en este ciclo de afectaciones al medio ambiente y a la, a la calidad del agua y a la salud. Esa sería mi pregunta. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, comisionado Rolón. Now I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Ari Fulcan. Sorry, I didn't hear you, um, Chair, but I assume you're giving me the floor. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, exactly. You, uh, you have you. the floor, please. Th thank you, Commissioner Bernal. And good morning to everyone again. Um, it's an honor for me to be uh, present in this hearing. Um, and I wanted to welcome all of you and thank you very much for, for your testimonies, both from civil society and from the state. Uh, as I said, I, I regard this as an extremely important hearing. And as rapporteur, uh, rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples, um, I should have started with my name, my apologies. My name is Arif Bolkan. Um, and as rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples, uh, I, I think that this information that we've gotten here today is extremely um, useful and beneficial and important. Um, and hopefully can lead to an eventual resolution of these issues faced by the community. Um, let me just add that I empathize um, with, with the stories that I've heard, the very graphic testimonies given um, by Chief Turtle uh, and Chief uh, De Silva of what their communities experience. And as I said, I hope that this process and the, the visibility that might result from it uh, and, and from the engagement with the state, um, that there might be some uh, resolution um, or remediation of, of the issues facing. Um, I have some specific interventions that I'd like to make. Um, first of all, um, I, I have to acknowledge that the state has um, recounted in great detail, uh, Mr. Tikhanov, and thank you very much for this. Um, you have recounted in great detail um, all of the interventions made by the state of Canada since the discovery of this problem. Um, but um, the, the Chief Turtle and Chief De Silva have testified before us, have, has given from, from their interventions, um, the ongoing problems faced by the community and, and what they um, describe as the ongoing effects of the pollution, um, the effects on the community, the effects on their economy um, and, and, and the spill-off effects uh, in relation to their, the sustainability of their lifestyles and, and, and under future generations, the younger folks who are leaving, um, as they say. So given, given um, this sort of conflict between what we're hearing that's going on on the ground, um, as compared with what the state, the interventions from the state, um, perhaps I could ask specifically of, of, of Amnesty International and the other CSOs and, and of course of, of the chiefs um, present here, uh, what specific interventions do you think would be helpful from the state, from the provincial and, and, and federal government um, with regard to um, correcting, um, correcting this ongoing problem? Um, you know, given given the, the, the ongoing prob, um, programs that have established by, by the federal government and by the provincial government, um, and the funds that have been allocated, are there specific policies or programs? Um, are there specific action plans that you think that have been omitted or not taken into consideration um, that are necessary to redress and remedi remediate the problem? Um, and, and the other thing that I, I, I wanted to have some clarity on, and, and I should have started with this actually, is really the specific situation right now as regards the river. Because we've heard that for the past 50 years, there have been these kinds of um, interventions. And Mr. Tikhanov has spoken to, I, I think I heard this, a, declining, a decline in the mercury levels. Um, but from what the chiefs have been saying, and, and of course, Amnesty International, it doesn't appear to be the case. So can you comment um, really on the, 
on the current status of, 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 the, of, the, of, of the river and the area and um, you know, what's the position with regard to the contamination. Um, and, and as I said earlier, um, any specific programs or policies that you think are essential um, for remediating the problem. The other thing that I wanted to ask about, uh, and, and of course, um, either the petitioners or, or the state can, can reply or both, uh, and it's something that my colleague, uh, Commissioner Rallon touched on, uh, and, and, and this, it, this is um, the issue that was raised as well by the petitioners of what appears to be concessions that are continue to be um, issued in this area. Um, so we have this historic problem from 50 years ago. The Chief Turtle said, you know, 50 years ago, there was no knowledge of this, but you'd think things would change. Um, uh, but apparently uh, concessions are still being issued. If you could perhaps tell me, are these concessions uh, in titled areas or areas used by territories, used by, by the communities? Um, and, and if so, what are what processes have been followed prior to issuing them? Has the provincial or state gov uh, national government respected principles of uh, free prior informed consent? And are there guidelines that have been followed in the law and policy with regard, not just to the consultation of communities, but with regard to the standards to be adopted by these companies in terms of, um, mitigation or even prevention of pollution and contamination um, or with regard to uh, rehabilitation of, of uh, and cleanup of affected areas and, and of course with benefit sharing. Um, so I, I hope these questions are clear. I look forward to um, answers from both, as I said, the petitioners and the state. And thank you very much again for listening to me. Thank you, Commissioner Bulkan. And uh, before I make a couple of remarks, uh, if I still have time, I would like to give the floor to uh, Javier Palomo, the Special Rapporteur for Economic and Social Rights of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much, Chair. ¿Me escuchan bien? Perfecto. Um, voy a tratar de ser muy breve. No me voy a presentar porque me acaba de, de presentar el vicepresidente comisionado Carlos Bernal. Soy Javier Palumo, de, de la Redesca. Eh, el sistema interamericano, creo que es importante recordar que ha señalado que el respeto a un medio ambiente sano se materializa en deberes concretos. Esto está presente en la resolución eh, sobre emergencia climática, de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y, y su relatoría especial sobre derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales, también en jurisprudencia de la Corte Interamericana, tanto en opiniones consultivas como sentencias en casos contenciosos. Este, y entre los deberes se encuentra asegurar, respetar que la legislación ambiental vigente, los estándares y los principios internacionales en, en la materia, entre esa legislación y, y esos principios y estándares internacionales haya un, una correlación. Y esto implica también procesos de debida diligencia respecto del impacto de la actividad, especialmente actividades empresariales. Este, me remito al informe de Empresas y Derechos Humanos en ese sentido. Este, implementación, les decía, de procesos de debida diligencia respecto al impacto de este tipo de actividades en los derechos humanos y el clima, y también la remediación y la reparación de las víctimas de degradación ambiental. En esta audiencia hemos venido escuchando testimonios preocupantes sobre impactos perjudiciales que estas comunidades han experimentado desde hace mucho tiempo, en diversos derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales, salud, trabajo, cultura, agua, entre otros, la forma de vida de estas comunidades ha sido claramente impactada por la contaminación por mercurio y el Estado ha tomado medidas en relación a este, a este fenómeno y las ha narrado en su, en su presentación. Sin embargo, me permito solicitar mayor información 
en relación a algunos aspectos. Primero, me gustaría obtener mayor información sobre los impactos en la salud mental y sobre impactos diferenciados respecto de niños, niñas y adolescentes, personas mayores y mujeres. Y especialmente me gustaría obtener más información acerca del de acceso a la justicia y las reparaciones que han sido concedidas en el marco del funcionamiento regular de las políticas públicas, políticas de acceso a la justicia en relación a esta, a esta temática. Mi segunda pregunta tiene relación con la consulta previa, libre, informada, la accesibilidad de la información y la participación de la Primera Nación Gracina Rose en todos estos asuntos que evidentemente son de gran preocupación. Y la tercera pregunta en relación específicamente para el Estado tiene relación con poder obtener mayor información acerca de las normas de derechos humanos que regulan estas actividades empresariales con especial atención a el tema participación de las comunidades en la toma de decisiones, acceso a la justicia, remediación y reparación. Nos interesa especialmente desde la red ESCA obtener más información sobre la coordinación en los distintos niveles de gobierno y vuelvo a hacer un énfasis específico en asegurar la participación de las comunidades afectadas en todo este proceso. Muchísimas gracias, Presidente. Thank you so much, Special Rapporteur, for his comments. And uh, I just have two questions that, uh, that I wanted to, to follow up with both parties. The first one is whether uh, the, there has been a litigation about this case on the basis of the Charter of uh, Freedoms and Rights of Canada. And uh, if you can give us more information about that, uh, that would be very helpful. And then my, my second point, Uh, is refers to something that the rapporteur just mentioned, uh, namely, I, I'm not sure uh, why um, no one has spoken about the framework for compliance uh, of businesses in Canada uh, concerning human rights issues in uh, developed countries, comparable developed countries like uh, France or and Germany they not only abide by international principles like the uh, 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 human, uh, United Nations principles on businesses and human rights, but also on, on domestic legislation that imp impose a compliance duties concerning all human rights uh, limitations and possible affectations by every kind of business. And there are particular sensitivities concerning mining and uh, uh, businesses that can trigger uh, human rights violations like the one that is the center of this hearing. So I wonder if I can uh, get more information from the parties and from the, from the states. What's, what's Canada's status concerning uh, the possibility of uh, having a, an, a federal framework or a state frame, framework concerning a business compliance with a human rights and also the, the attached uh, responsibilities and also the measures to compensate the victims and to, re and to redress. And, and my final point concerns this one is to what extent this company has been accountable and namely liable also to compensate for the human rights violations that the petitioners of the Syrians have suffered. Thank you so much. So I would like, if there are no more questions on the, um, on the floor by the commission, I would like to give the, now the chance to, to the petitioners to speak during 12 minutes. Uh, uh, and after that, the state would have a rejoinder for 12 minutes. And then 
uh, will have the final word to, to close the hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, we would like to do our final remarks and I will start with that and then I'll pass the, the voice to the community. With all the information described above, we respectfully request the Inter-American Commission and in particular its reportership on indigenous people to continue monitoring the situation in the Grassy Narrows First Nation and include the information provided during this hearing in the Inter-American 2024 Annual Report. We urge the Inter-American Commission to draft a report about the current situation of indigenous peoples in Canada. Lastly, we call to the Inter-American Commission to request the state of Canada, one, stop the violence and the harm against the Grassy Narrows Nation. Immediately implement all the necessary measures to halt the mercury contamination and viral, environmental degradation of the Grassy Narrows lands, water, and food sources. Implement a comprehensive system of address the medical conditions suffered by those affected by mercury contamination in the Grassineros First Nation. And four, recognize the Grassineros sovereignty over its own territory. And with this, I would like to give the floor uh, to Adrienne Telford to continue with the questions. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Adrienne Telford and I'm legal counsel to Grassineros First Nation. Um, I would like to respond to some of the questions that we've heard today. First, let me start by saying that uh, the state of Canada and the province of Ontario purport to have jurisdiction over these issues, including as a treaty partner with Grassy Narrows, which requires the Crown to uphold Grassy Narrows treaty right to fish, hunt, trap, and otherwise maintain their Anishinaabe way of life. The Crown also purports to have jurisdiction over the health of Grassy Narrows people, uh, the health of the environment, the fish and aquatic ecosystems, industrial contaminants and resource extractions, including the Dryden Mill that continues to this day to discharge contaminants into the ecosystem that harm both the fish and the Grassy Narrows people downstream. Uh, with respect to the question about whether Canada is respecting Grassy Narrows right to free prior and informed consent, uh, the record is clear that this right is not being respected, that the Crown continues to allow harmful industrial activities, including the Dryden Mill um, and mining, and even is considering uh, a nuclear waste disposal facility in or around Grassy Narrows territory, which without Grassy Narrows free prior and informed consent. Uh, with respect to some of the measures highlighted by the state of Canada, uh, we submit that they are wholly are woefully inadequate uh, with respect to the river cleanup and the mercury care home. These are commitments made by the Crown in 2017, so seven years ago. Uh, in relation to an environmental and human rights catastrophe that started over 60 years ago in 1962, the river still isn't cleaned up. There isn't even an, appro an approved remediation plan and will be many years before the cleanup of the river even begins. With respect to the Mercury Care Home, it still hasn't been built and it still isn't operating. Uh, nor does a Mercury Care Home stop the current poisoning of the people of Grassy Narrows. It is a Band-Aid measure to provide basic health care services to a vulnerable community that is in desperate need and that has woefully inadequate access to healthcare services. With respect to the English and Wabagoon River Remediations Panel, uh, this is the provincial entity that uh, purports to have um, a mandate of cleaning up the river. It has recently taken the position that it does not have jurisdiction or a mandate to, uh, uh, to stop the Dryden Mill from continuing to contaminate the environment and, and continuing to make the mercury problem worse. Um, <clears throat> uh, with respect to any litigation in this case on the basis of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, last month, Grassy initiated uh, a piece of litigation on the basis of Section 35 of the Constitution Act. This is separate from the Charter, the Canadian Charter. Uh, and this is with respect to the Crown's ongoing violation of Grassy Narrows treaty rights 
uh, and failure to uphold the honor of the crown and its fiduciary duties um, in relation to Grassy Narrows. Uh, now, with respect to the impacts on uh, youth, children, young girls, um, mothers and elderly, uh, I would like to ask either Chief Turtle or Judy De Silva to speak to this. I would simply say that uh, the suicide rates of youth in Grassy Narrows is extremely high. Uh, one of the highest in, on, in a First Nations in Ontario, if not Canada, and that this has been directly linked to the mercury. Um, I'd like to hand it over to either Chief Turtle or Judy De Silva to speak more to the impacts, including the mental health impacts on the people of Grassy Narrows. Um, no. I'd like Rudy to speak on that first. Okay, I, at the beginning of my in my open statement, I, I made reference to how our people are have lost motivation to to live an active life. I think that itself, you know, speaks volumes uh, because, as I mentioned, that. The environment and also the economy has been destroyed, and uh, because of the fact that there's really nothing to look forward to, it's caused a, a lot of problems for our young people like to have goals, to have aspirations, to have a have a, a good outlook on the future is very difficult for them. You have to realize that they're living in the community. Some of them will go to Kenora or Winnipeg or nearby uh, towns and cities, but 90% or 95% of their time is in the community and, uh, and they don't see the, you know, a future with, uh, with good prospects. So, you know, it's 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 very difficult. We 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 are, as I mentioned, doing the best we can and and uh, to address the situation and 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 uh, but uh, but at the same time, uh, the situation is isn't very good. So I'll, I'll get Judy to speak more. Um, <clears throat> so just listening to Constantine and just hearing all the, like the, all those things that he's talking about made, made it sound like the issues are being addressed, but we're still being poisoned. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that's really heartbreaking is the youth suicides and, um, it's very sensitive to talk about this in, in Grassy Narrows, as most of us have been impacted by uh, a suicide in families, and it's like really close to our hearts. And um, like I, I could say, like I've had four suicides in, in my family, immediate family, and it, it's been horrific. And um, you can't minimize anything, you know, from the effects of the poison. Like one of the things like they're talking about is um, you know, that they're they're covering the medical the medical cost for all of us. But at the at the base of this medical cost is racism we face at the hospitals, at the medical stations, and how we are treated inhumanely. I even heard of one one of our people tied to the bed and she had just skin and bones when she died. So like, how can you do that? And like in this time, this day, day and age. So 
just to put it to you realistically, we we are treated inhumanely and we are treated like we are in the way of uh, at every turn. And even the one youth that committed suicide, when the police came, by the time she got to the hospital two hours later, she's all bruised up. And then <clears throat> she asked for help on a Friday and the, the, the medical people said, okay, call us on Tuesday. That Friday she hung herself. She's only 17. So like that kind of horrific treatment of our young people as they reach for help, like it, it's not there. It's all like um, BS, sorry for the word, but it's like just putting it to you realistically, like what we have to face, the umbilical cord data was hidden from us. And it took Dr. Donna Mergler a long time to, to get that information. And it took like so much bureaucracy for her to get that umbilical cord data. And then the, the river mediation, the government did a study in 1985. And then they just put it in the shelf because our people didn't ask for river cleanup till recently. So 2014, when we we're protesting and all that, the government had the remediation outlined by Dr. John Rudd hidden on the shelf, collecting dust and not telling the people. So these are all things we always have to be pulling teeth to get information for our people to get mercury justice. I could say more and more on and on, but I'll, I'll stop there. And I just want to you know, keep praying for the young people as they struggle to, through this mercury poisoning, you know, their daily lives. I was just talking to a young person yesterday and when I was talking to her, she was just shaking just to talk to me, how, how scared she is. So like, I, I don't think I could put it any more clearly, like how the young people are struggling daily and they're, they're the ones suffering the most is these young people. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. If there are no more uh, persons who would like to speak on behalf of the civil society, I would like to give the floor to the state. Thank you for the opportunity to offer additional context to the earlier testimony. Um, there are so many questions, Commissioner, with respect that you have been asked that I cannot possibly physically address all of them within 12 minutes that allotted to me. So I presume that uh, we'll take notes and uh, address a few of them in writing. Uh, however, I will touch on a few. Um, the words meaning uh, is important. And so when we speak about a continued contamination of the English Wabigun River system and these references are made, very specifically, that is most likely, to my understanding, are to the in relation to the recent uh, um, study published by the Western University on the riverbank mercury methylation study that speaks actually the contamination by sulfates and the possibility of the, these chemicals to actually promote the methylation of mercury that is currently sequestered in these sediments. I mean, it's a technical issue, but just to answer the, the question, the what we are speaking about in terms of human exposure at a high levels of exposure at the population level of exposure, these have been uh, occurring in 19, late 1960s and 1970s. Um, ever since over, over the period of the 25 year long uh, program by monitoring program, it has been shown that the levels of exposure has significantly declined and declined below the levels where the population and the people that were, uh, that were exposed then are at risk. What we are dealing with here is actually an issue and an understanding of the length of the sequel of this high level of exposure. 
of the population and how long it takes in time and what variety of di different consequences occur that that and and that aspect of the of, of, of what is going on is also a learning um, pretty much for everybody uh, in understanding what what's happening and how long and this is where we supported the efforts of the communities both uh, both before uh, and 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 since 2000s to kind of conduct the studies and so you know, since early 2000s, uh, research methods supported by the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Indigenous Services Canada has evolved. Uh, and so today we fund First Nations directly to hire and work with scientists um, and, the, uh, and, and, and then provide direct in-kind support when asked. This community-based research, which Elder De Silva have been involved and led uh, herself, strengthens capacity building and empowers First Nations, and also fundamentally changes the nature of the community's economic relationship with researchers. I mean, there are two, um, in, in case of ANA, community-based research has enabled the community to continue looking at their data in the context of new science and knowledge about mercury exposure and its impacts, which inform community planning for supports. In terms of compensation for those people who have been found to suffer and the recent, uh, the recent data that we have received that over time, uh, the Mercury Disability Board that is the measure that was established in 1986-85 that was meant to provide one measure of compensation in addition to the monetary compensation that was provided to the communities from the federal government, uh, the uh, Ontario government, and actually the commercial partners that directly implicated in this uh, in this terrible uh, dumping of mercury into the English Wabagoon River system. So it is the Mercury Disability Board that continues being managed and funded by the province of Ontario and with, with some support from the federal government. But in, ter in terms of uh, research initiatives that really promote that community-based approach, the one that I would like to mention is the First Nations Environmental Contaminants Program. Uh, uh, which provides funding to First Nations for community-based research in partnership with academia that assesses human exposure through body burden of contaminants sampling of traditional food dietary service at many times. I think that since 2003, the program has funded six research projects related to mercury specifically in ANA. Five of these projects tested various wildlife for metals, including mercury and organics. One tested mercury in hair from residents of ANA and Wabasimo. All of these studies found mercury levels lower than in previous earlier studies. However, mercury levels in walleye and pike, the predatory fish often exceed the fish consumption guidelines and mercury levels in fish eating mammals were also elevated. So that is being addressed through the risk communication, including the one that is translated in the Ojibwe language to First Nations communities, not only in and Wabasimu, but across the country. And so in addition to that, um, we also worked with the Treaty 3 in order to provide uh, fishermen and uh, uh, fishers in the communities uh, with the map of uh, of the of the mercury in different lakes based on the Ontario data that continues being updated on a regular basis that give an indication where it would be best to fish. Now, from 2008 to 2019, FINEB also funded and supported the First Nations Food Nutrition Environment Study, which is led by which was led by a consortium of researchers from the University of Ottawa, Assembly of First Nations, and University of Montreal to undertake the first total diet study of First Nations adults in Canada. The study included mercury, new mercury biomonitoring component, to systematically survey 3,404 First Nations individuals living on. 92 reserves across Canada, including ANA, in order to update existing information. And funding for participants from ANA based on investigations conducted in 2011 were released in 2013, showing that current levels of mercury exposure in ANA are much lower today than they were in 1970s, 1980s, as well as in 2004. In the eco zone where ANA is situated, three out of 152 men and uh, women um, uh, above 50 years old, and one out of 57 randomly sampled women of childbearing age exceeded the mercury and hair guidelines. Repeat testing at no cost was offered to these individuals. 
Back in 1970s, not just today, back in 1970s, the Task Force on Organic Mercury, mercury in the Environment concluded that the most serious consequences of mercury pollution in ANA were economic, social, and cultural, and these needed to be considered alongside health. Government of Canada's support for community-based research and recent large-scale investment in community infrastructure in ANA and Wabasimu will support, we believe, the communities to move forward from these broader consequences of past mercury poisoning. And the Government of Canada continues to work with and support ANA, Wabasimung, and other Indigenous peoples by responding to new health signs, data, and information, improving service delivery, and gradually transitioning toward more First Nations-led healthcare services. Now, there were, in addition to that, uh, do I have time, Chair? Um, Yes, yeah. you still so, have uh, four minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, uh, trying to go through the list uh, of, of those uh, questions that I was able to, to record after I figured out how they're being translated in the, in the, in the caption. So uh, the, um, the question is, uh, the question was about what, what the overall the process in terms of the industrial development. In general, in Canada, under the Impact Assessment Act of 2019, federal scientists and impact assessment specialists conduct federal impact assessment of major projects, including uh, like, such as mines, ports, and hydroelectric developments. The process is managed federally by the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, which is coordinating the review of environmental, economic, social, and health impacts of these projects and engaging meaningfully with indigenous people and the public in that process. That is kind of an overall kind of framework how the new large industrial developments occur. At the same time, there are also, there is a division of jurisdiction in relation to the industrial developments between the province and the federal government. So not all of the industrial developments would be um, uh, within, falling within the, the review of the, um, uh, specifically Impact Assessment Act federally. Some of them would be within the uh, provincial jurisdiction. And in that regard, the information uh, community should provide, should uh, uh, ask for additional information from the province of Ontario for information regarding the industrial activities. Concerning the remediation, I provided you in my main testimony, the, the information that we have in that regard. Overall, the mercury has been sequestered, and that was the idea that it would sequester, get sequestered in the sediment. Now, imagining a um, a massive cleanup of the river system, and that is my personal opinion. I've been working at this, not on the environmental, but on the human health side. I think it is important to um, to, to let the, the scientists and the province of Ontario to really figure out how to do it safely, because the risk of doing it in the wrong way would be volatilizing mercury that has been sequestered in the sediments. We don't want to make quick mistakes like that, because that would, uh, that would not be helpful. So um, that's the, uh, all I have. Um, to say to 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 respond to the um, um, to some of the comments uh, that I'm able to address at this moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the representative of the state. I just would like to know if uh, my colleagues uh, Ari or Estuardo have follow up questions or comments. Uh, Ari, please. Floor is yours. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I just wanted to um, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I just wanted to uh, close off my remarks with, with just uh, reiterating some of the some of the issues that I've heard today very briefly. Um, as I said, and I thank uh, the state, Mr. Tikhanov, for the information you've provided. Um, we know that Canada prides itself as being um, you know, it's certainly this is the image of a very caring country with very progressive values. And, and I think in that context, given what we've heard today, um, I, I think that it's, it's really important for us to remember um, some of the standards that, that should guide 
um, the remediation or addressing this issue. Um, in spite of all that we've heard about the, the money that has been allocated and, and the promises that have been made, um, what the petitioners are saying, and I just wanted to, um, to close with this, is that, um, from what I understand, is that this problem, certainly with the mercury uh, that, that was discovered in the 60s, has still not been addressed. And, and that the, the river, even though in 2017 that there was some plan, the river is still in its present state. Um, so even bearing in mind that you have to be careful and you don't want to make it worse, um, action still needs to be taken. And action that also includes not just a band-aid to use the word of the council, but that, that is preventative. And so um, I think bearing this in mind, I, I, I think what's important to, for, I think for us to leave this with is one, that there is litigation now, and I suppose in the context of that litigation, perhaps there might be um, an opportunity for um, more enforceable um, commitments by the state. Um, but perhaps what the petitioners can consider as well is through this rapporteurship of the commission, um, whether not just continued monitoring as Amnesty International has proposed, but some kind of more perhaps direct dialogue with the state, um, which maybe might be facilitated if there is, uh, if there are concrete proposals perhaps that can be put, um, that, that can be considered. Um, because as I said, taking as a given that the state is interested in, in, in addressing this issue. And, and, and I'll close by, by saying that all of this has to be considered in the context of international human rights standards. Um, and and I'd, I'd just like to, to refer to two documents, the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, and Un United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, both which might not, have bind might not be binding on states, but they certainly encapsulate standards that, that are increasingly regarded as customary international law and that are in, incorporated in, in national laws. And in particular, the American Declaration, Article 18, which speaks to the collective and individual right to the highest attainable standard of physical, mental, and spiritual health of indigenous peoples, and Article 19, the right to protection of a healthy environment for indigenous peoples. And I think, uh, and, and of course, UN Drifts, as I said, which also echoes um, rights to the environment and the highest attainable standard of mental health and health. Um, I think it's important for all parties to bear this in mind in going forward um, in going forward for a solution to this, which is long overdue. I thank the petitioners very much and, and the state. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I would like to give the floor to the rapporteur, Javier Palomo, to close the hearing. And then I will do a final close and a, and a photo. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Yo no quiero extenderme mucho más, solo este, mencionar que, que me gustaría, como he, como he referido en mi primera intervención, poder recibir más información acerca de la normativa de presas y derechos humanos aplicable a esta situación, tanto de la, por parte de la sociedad civil como por parte del Estado, así como de los planes de remediación y las acciones vinculadas a garantizar la participación y el acceso a la justicia. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Rapporteur. And then with these words, I would like to just um, finish this hearing and uh, again reiterate the importance of this dialogue between the civil society and the state. I hope that this can create new uh, ways of interlocution to solve these very delicate human rights issues. And I hope also that the company can be involved next time in the dialogue uh, also. And uh, without you, uh, I think we have uh, time for a photo. So if uh, the competent person can give us the instructions, I would appreciate it. Yes, please uh, stare at the camera. And we're going to take the picture in three, two, one. OK, and go for one more. Three, two, one. Thank you so much.
Ok, thank you so much. Muchas gracias a todos y que les vaya muy bien. All the best to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Hasta luego. Buen día. Thank you.